Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Hunter Ohanian, and I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's about 87 degrees here, and it's been another lovely, beautiful day. We want to welcome you all to South Florida. Um, we have a great opening scheduled for you tonight. You can see the show right here, Elected Sisters. It's kind of hard to read over my shoulder like this, but I think it's great uh, to be able to do this. And uh, just so you know, uh, this event is going to be recorded and uh, it'll be put up on our website. So if you want to share it with other people, we uh, will appreciate that. Um, and um, also, and you can let people know about it. The archives are actually open uh, Monday through Friday from 11 to 5 every day. And so um, please stop by and see the show. And plus this whole exhibition will actually be put up on our website very soon. Not only the, the talk, but um, we just got a little behind on a few things this week. And so uh, we haven't put it up, up here yet. But I want to do a shout out to a couple of people. First of all, to Emery Grant, our, our de deputy director. Emery, come around. Oh, there, there he is. Okay. <laughs> but don't get too, too close. You have a mask on, but I don't, so I can do it. And um, Ima Duverge is right over here. Ima, how are you? Uh, we, have, we have to wave to you. Ima is a new, um, uh, well, you're t technically a fellow and, a, uh, and an intern here recently graduated from Barnard College and, and uh, Ima was in the Peace Corps. Where, where were you in the Peace Corps? In Uganda. In Uganda. And after only about five months, she had to leave due to the coronavirus. And so we were very pleased to have Ima here and be able to get, capture her time. And so she's going to be here this fall uh, helping us with some marketing. So if you're seeing more activity on Facebook and Instagram, and again, hello to everybody out there in Instagram and as well as everybody on Facebook, uh, we want to be sure uh, to thank it, Ima. And if you have any ideas, by the way, of things that you want to see on any of our social media accounts, um, feel free to tag us, feel free to send us notes and comments and anything uh, that, that you'd like us to do. We've got a lot of stuff going on. And just for those of you who haven't been here before, Emery, can we just turn the camera around a little? Oh, yeah. Let's go this, this way. Just for those who have not been here, over my shoulders right here, you're looking at 28,000 volumes of LGBTQ history in a variety of books here. And if you turn just a little bit more over here, you'll see our development director, uh, <laughs> uh, Onique Forsetlock here, who's about to go and visit her family. And she's very excited about that. And if we have a few moments here at the end, uh, I will take everybody for a tour into the archive area as well too. But let's start with this exhibition, Elected Sisters. Um, pioneering by lesbian and trans political leaders. And this idea re really sort of came to us last year when we were thinking about the idea that uh, the election would be very much on everybody's minds this year. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at some firsts and we wanted to look at ways in which we could go into the archives and actually impact um, people's thinking about the upcoming election. Let me say this up front. Um, we're not advocating for any particular candidate, nor are we advocating for any political party. But what we want more than anything else, I think, is for people to think about the importance of their own registration and where they can vote. And it's the most important thing that you can actually do is be sure that you know how to vote and that those of you around you feel comfortable understanding how they can vote. But one of the things that I was thinking about, of course, is that we now have, again, a woman as a candidate for vice president. It's the third time in history that's happened. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro and uh, Sarah Palin, and now we have Kamala Harris. And that is tr truly an accomplishment. And of course, as we all know, four years ago, a woman, Hillary Clinton, uh, attempted to run for president. It was not successful. And there's been a lot of changes with regard to women's roles in politics. And uh, the election two years ago, as you can see here, uh, the number of, of women running for public office has grown over the last years. And LGBTQ women have put themselves forward early and often. Um, but it has come at a cost for many of those individuals. Uh, they've had bullets shot at their windows. They've endured insults and harassment. Their lives and families have been threatened. And unfortunately, this harassment, particularly against uh, 
by trans and lesbian women actually continues to the present day. Uh, in 2018, one LGBTQ candidate was publicly harassed by an opponent as a radical socialist kickboxing lesbian Indian. Imagine saying that. Um, and she should go backpacking back to the reservation where she came from. There was another candidate, a transgender uh, candidate for governor, um, who actually was getting so many threats that she had to um, hide her campaign schedule. Now, can you imagine what it's like trying to do something which is about visibility, which is about trying to get people engaged in your effort, but because of the harassment that was actually happening, was, uh, was preventing her from doing the job that she was just trying to, to do. Um, and also, we're going to be looking at some pioneers in this field, but I think it's important to think also about now, we're going to start back in 1974, but now in 2020, the women, and particularly the LGBTQ women, who have really um, found places of prominence. And they are, you know, they're the present day thinkers and leaders that we want to thank, uh, thank for the work that they're doing. So we've given a shout out to Anise Parker, who was the first woman, first lesbian as a mayor of a major city. Uh, we now have Lori Lightfoot, who is the mayor of Chicago. We have three open LGBTQ women in the United States Congress, Tammy Baldwin and Kirsten Sinema from, uh, from uh, uh, Arizona are both in the U.S. Senate, and uh, Angie Craig, uh, Sharice Davids, and Katie Hill are in the U.S. House, House of Representatives. And so that's kind of an astonishing thing. When I was in my 20s or 30s, the idea of seeing five women in the U.S. Congress would have been unheard of, five lesbian or lesbian and bi women. And just as a final note in the introduction here, the Victory Fund, uh, which is a political, a non, a non partisan political active, uh, action committee, estimates that there are now today 698 LGBTQ elected officials in the United States. But if you consider the number of estimated LGBTQ people in the United States and the number of seats that are available, this is only 0.4 of 1%. So there's still lots more work that everybody has to, <coughs> has to, to do. So Emery, if we can pull down here, I'm sorry, I've got a little frog in, in my throat. And let's start with Kathy Kozinchenko. Uh, Kathy is actually the first woman um, who is the first out lesbian uh, to be elected. And actually, Monique, if you could grab me some water, that would, would be very good. Um, she was elected in 1974, actually three years before Harvey Milk's um, election, and she was elected to the Ann Arbor City Council. And um, she had a hard time as well, even though this happened um, 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago. Um, her, uh, her election was not without opposition. Republican city councilman at the time, Clyde William Colburn, claimed to have been, thank you, claimed to have been outraged, not only by her, but also by two other council members because she ran as an open lesbian. She was going to school at the time. She was a member of what was known as the Human Rights Party. Two other people came out at the time um, and um, he, he actually, so this Republican um, actually lost his seat uh, shortly th thereafter, and he blamed it because the city was being taken over by hippies and faggots, in his, in his words there. Um, she only stayed in office for the one term for two years, and then she ended up moving to, to New York, and then she and her partner moved to Pittsburgh, where she is t today, and uh, we'd love to hear from her at some time as well. But here you see in the advocate, uh, and this is from 1972, about how Ann Arbor uh, was passing the broadest law yet on gay rights. And she was instrumental in creating a lesbian gay, pr uh, gay pride week proclamation and also having the words sexual orientation put into uh, the human rights bill in Ann Arbor at that time. What you're looking at here, and again, if we can look here, this is a publication called Lesbian Connection. And we have a complete run in the archive of this 
um, magazine, and some of you may re remember it. This is the very first edition. It came out of East Lansing, Michigan, and it was a way for lesbians, not just in Michigan, uh, where Kit Kathy was, but for, for them to be able to connect with, with each other. And you can see the topics and things. It was, it was done by a collective, by a group called uh, Amazing Amazons. But they were talking about more women dykes in the future, how you can help uh, lesbian art. And then here, of course, you can see on the political scene where women were actually trying to help each other and advise each other how they could become candidates for public office. So let's leave the Middle West and go to New England. And I think many people are probably familiar with the work of Elaine Noble. Elaine was elected in 1974, and uh, she was the first woman elected to a state legislature in the United States. She served for two terms, a total of four years, and then after her fifth year, uh, I'm sorry, after the end of her fourth year, she ran for the United States Senate as an open lesbian. And we actually have in the case here some paraphernalia from Elaine Noble's um, 1976 campaign, or 1978 campaign for the United States uh, Senate. Unfortunately, she did not win the, that race, and she didn't serve in any more um, uh, elected offices after that, but she has been a leader and an inspiration to many women. And um, while she was in the Massachusetts state legislature, she um, was very instrumental in establishing the first statewide ethics commission. And of course, she uh, introduced the first gay rights bill in the Massachusetts legislature. And as many of you might know, Massachusetts was one of the leading uh, states in the United States um, on civil rights re relating to the LGBTQ community. And here again from the archives, we have a plaque from the Boston JCEs recognizing her in 1977 as one of the 10 outstanding young leaders in Boston. Moving back um, to the uh, Midwest, um, is a woman by the name of Karen Clark. Karen um, retired from the state legis legislature in Minnesota um, after serving for almost four de decades. She was in um, the state legislature for 37 years. Um, when, she served, when she left office in, in 2017, she was the longest serving openly, um, uh, uh, openly, uh, openly lesbian legislator in the United States. She was first elected in 1980, the year that Ronald Reagan was elected for president uh, at the age of 35. Um, and she was actually from the rural parts of Minnesota. Um, and her, notice, her notable accomplishments in the four decades in the Minnesota House include overseeing an amendment to the, Massachusetts, or to the Minnesota Human Rights Act um, in 1933, banning 1993, banning discrimination based upon sexual orientation for employment, housing, and advocating for the rights of all people, uh, regardless of legal status. Uh, she played a pivotal role in adding the words sexual orientation to the Minnesota Rights Act and in passing the Marriage Equality Act in 2013, which legalized same-sex marriages in Minnesota. But upon her retirement, um, Karen said, some of you, of course, know me for the work that I've done, particularly as a lesbian woman with the LGBTQ community, providing some leadership there. And clearly, she was underselling her, her part, but I hope you'll also look at all the other things that I did. She was very much involved in environmental causes, causes about um, affordable housing and aid to senior citizens, which is an interesting thing that these pioneering women who took these roles on Yes, they were concerned about LGBTQ rights and LGBTQ culture, but they also were concerned about everyone's environment. They, they played their jobs and served their roles as legislatures in their various um, capacities to really serve the, all of their constituents. It wasn't as if they were simply there just to represent the gay people in their, their districts. In, um, 
in Elaine Knit Noble's instance, there were 250,000 people in her di district. It was the Fenway and Beacon Hill and Back Bay. And so um, it, was, it was an area with a lot of di different needs. And of course, in Boston at the time that she was uh, elected, I think it was the year after uh, forced busing had come uh, to, to the city of Boston. So there was a lot of strife that was going on at the time. Moving here uh, just a little bit further, we wanted to show you, as always, we, we like to be able to allow you to take books out from the library. And so here are a number of books that are available to you. Uh, Trailblazers, uh, Profiles of Americans, Gay and Lesbian Elected Officials, um, A Place at the t Table, and Profiles in Gay and Lesbian uh, Courage. But one thing we wanted to mention here is this very old, um, page from the minutes, and these, these minutes go back to 1965, June of 1965, and these are from an organization called the Daughters of Bolitis. Now, some of you may know of it because it was very well known for publishing a publication known as The Ladder, and we have a complete collection of The Ladder here in our archives. But here, what you're, so this was a group that was started um, in San Francisco in um, 1955. And basically, these lesbians got together to create political clout. And also, they wanted to create an alternative to having to go to bars and other places that were being uh, raided by, by the police, and they wanted to have other alternatives. This set of minutes from, this is from the San Francisco chapter of the Daughters of Politis. And the thing that's really interesting to me about it is here you see, so this is June 1965, and here you see that they are discussing a 1966 convention, and the very topic is the changing role of women um, and uh, how women enter politics. So it's a beginning part of being able to see where w women were being empowered and to be, and they were, they were helping and, and encouraging each other to find places and find a seat at the t table. Um, moving here, let's move to California. And um, in California, uh, Ro uh, Roberta Actenberg is somebody who we've selected to talk about. She was a candidate for the California State Assembly in 1988, and unfortunately, she did not win that election, but the following year, she was elected to the uh, San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Um, in her, so in her campaign, she worked very hard to not only to be a proponent for LGBTQ rights, but she actually worked to expose cronyism that had been rooted in economic power and the influence of a long-standing political di dynasty. She was also very influential in that her campaign introduced the idea that good liberals do not equally weigh issues such as LGBTQ civil rights, access to health care, racism, parental rights, and sexism. So while she was, she was still talking to a progressive crowd, she was also trying to let people understand that even though certain individuals were progressive, there were possibly areas that they weren't, and that sexism and racism were still issues that many within the LGBTQ community had to address. Um, next, we'll go to another sitting elected official. This is Deborah Glick. And um, Deborah was elected in, in 1990, 30 years ago, and she is still serving in the New York State uh, Legislature, uh, the New York State Assembly. She lives in Greenwich Village, and if you can see here, here she is right there in Sheridan Square. And um, she was very active in politics, younger in her life. And her victories, of course, include the passage of Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act and the Hospital Visitation Bill for the state of New York, which provided domestic partners the same rights as spouses and next of kin when caring for a loved one in a hospital or in a nursing facility. What's interesting about thinking about what we found in the archives about her is here what you're looking at is the cover of the New York Native. Um, this cover was in January 21st, 1991. It was at the time that Deborah Glick was sworn into office. She won her election in the fall of 1990. 
you have a seven, so you have, you're now looking at it, the original copy of probably the most widely distributed LGBTQ publication in New York at the time, and they didn't run a story about it. What was that about? The best they could do was they could quote from the New York Times, and the Times, of course, mentioned the fact that she was the first open lesbian to be elected in the state of New York in a state-held office. But the gay newspaper, which FYI at the time was saying a political group in California says that aspirin can increase uh, uh, t, t4 cells, which is, uh, as we know, there were many theories at the time about trying to find uh, causes and uh, cures for HIV and AIDS. But the but but it was it was nearly impossible until years later that we could actually find mention of this lesbian who was a pioneer is still a pioneer in the state of New York. Uh, again, uh, general press we found plenty of it, but we were. But at the time of her election, you can go back and you can see, for example, here in the Bay Area Reporter, you can see Actenberg is prominently featured here as a candidate. And then Emery comes back over here. Here you see Gay City News, uh, which is the Boston Gay newspaper, and Elaine Noble's victory is prominently placed here. But what was happening at that time that that particular um, uh, a publisher and newspaper and, and source for gay, gay news didn't find uh, that to, to be important. Um, next, I want to go over to Gail um, Shibley. And um, Gail was elected in, 19, in 1992, and then she was reelected again in 1994. Uh, she was the first woman elected to the Oregon State Legislature. Uh, she also was a Democrat as well, and everybody that we've gone through so far has been a Democrat with the exception of Kathy Concheco, and she was a member of something that was known at the time as the Human Rights Party, uh, or H Human Rights yeah. Campaign? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, or no, I think it's Human, Rights Party. Yeah, H Human Rights Party. But with Gail, um, Gail, of course, was uh, influential with a lot of the same issues. Um, uh, while in office, she fought the 1992 ballot measure that was organized by the Oregon Citizens Alliance, a conservative group active in the early 1990s. Their goal was to amend the Oregon Constitution to prohibit any government agency which promoted, encouraged, or facilitated homosexuality. Imagine that. Somebody was actually putting something, attempting to put something in the Constitution that would in their state's constitution that would deny uh, rights to or infant funding to any group that tried to facilitate promoted or encouraged homosexuality. So she, um, she successfully ran against that group and thankfully uh, that measure uh, was not passed in the state of Oregon and, and that was de defeated. But again, it goes to show the importance of actually being able to be there at the right time. Um, and what you're looking at right here is a copy from our archives of a publication called Off Our, uh, Off Our Backs. Uh, we have a complete run of this as well. And this goes back to July uh, 1991. Um, she uh, left office after four years and um, then she became a well-known uh, Democrat insider. Um, but I think also what's important for, for us to remember with regard to her, that Oregon then went on to uh, elect other LGBTQ women in powerful positions. In 2011, Tina Kotek was elected Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. And then 2015, Kate Brown was elected Governor of the State of Oregon. Um, the next person we pulled up, and again, we wanted part of what we were trying to do here is, is to show the depth of the publications that we have in the archives. And so here we, here's uh, an issue of the Washington Blade uh, going back to October 9th, 1992. And here you see Colorado gays say it's a civil war over civil rights. And this was at the time in Colorado that they had passed an amendment which was an anti-gay amendment to their constitution in Colorado. That happened in 1992. 
that the Colorado Constitution was changed. But the year before, Joanne Conti was elected as a member of the Arvada Colorado City Council. She ran as an independent and she was a transgender person. So she was the first transgender individual who was elected to a city council. Now, she was at a point in which she did not want to come out, but because her political opponents investigated her, we're gonna see that again in a moment, because her political opponents investigated her and found discrepancies in her background, she was actually forced to come out as a transgender individual. And to her credit, she did. And, uh, and so she is the first known transgender individual to be elected to a public office. Um, uh, though I'm gonna change that in one second when we talk about Althea Garrison. Um, so the, the, the correct thing about Joanne Conti is that she is the first um, out trans, uh, transgender person to be elected to a city council. Next, I want to uh, bring our attention to Cheryl Jacques. Uh, Cheryl was from, or still is, from the state of Massachusetts as well. And uh, she is the first openly lesbian member of the Massachusetts State Senate. She was elected in 1992. She's actually served six terms uh, from 1993 to 2004. Before that, she was an assistant district attorney in Middlesex County, um, and she was an assistant um, attorney general. And she also uh, ran for the US Congress, but unfortunately lost the Democratic primary to Stephen Lynch. And Stephen Lynch might be in that position in Congress right now. I, I'd have to double check that. Um, and she actually came out when she started her campaign, she didn't come out as an open lesbian, but she actually came out halfway through the, the campaign because she was preparing for a re-election debate about funding in the Massachusetts State Schools Program and the problems that gay and lesbian children were having in Massachusetts at that time. The, the tra traumas and the bullying that they were, uh, th that were affecting them. And that was so powerful on her that she decided the only honest thing that she could do would be to come out. She served for eight years and then she went on to be the uh, director of the Human Rights Campaign Fund. And she actually addressed the Democratic National Convention in 2004. And here you see um, a copy of Out magazine from uh, January 2001, in which this is the uh, top LGBTQ people in the United States, uh, the 100 top ones. And she was listed as uh, one of the top LGBTQ people at the turn of the century. And then we have two more candidates here. First, we have Liz uh, Stefanics. And Liz was elected to the New Mexico State Senate. Uh, first in 1993, and then again in 2017. There was about a 15 year gap between the period of time that she served the first time and the time that she was elected in, 27, in, uh, in 2017. And she's now serving in the state legislature in, uh, in New Mexico. Uh, she is from the northern part, mostly rural part of the state. Um, and she's worked, uh, she's worked quite hard as far as uh, helping the elderly and in, um, in expanding health care coverage and the environment in New Mexico. And finally, in this uh, group of people, and by the way, if people have questions, just feel free to post them um, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that people have. Finally, I want to bring attention to Althea Garrison. And Althea um, has, uh, was in the city of Boston, and uh, she was actually elected twice. The first time she was elected was in the Massachusetts State House of Representatives in 1992. And interestingly, she um, was elected to that position because her opponent was not able to file the proper nomination papers. And so she almost got the seat by de default at, at that time. Um, and uh, she is known for being the first uh, transgender person to be elected to any public office. So she's actually before Joanne Conte. Uh, she did not win re-election um, after her first win 
She kept on running for different offices and she ran for the Boston City Council in 2017 and she came into the to the um, the way it works it's the top vote getters and she came and she got the uh, uh, she just missed it by one spot but there was a member of the city council by the name of um, uh, Ariana Pressler who became a member of the U US Congress when she left to become a member of the Congress Althea Garrison went up and took that seat and here you see her uh, with uh, current Boston Mayor Marty Walsh um, uh, being sworn into office. Her story is somewhat similar to some of the other stories um, that we have seen here, that she, even though she pioneered for a lot of these issues, she was actually forced into this situation um, in that uh, she was again outed by her political opponents. Um, in the race in 1993, uh, there was somebody who was working for the Boston Herald at the time, and he ended up working uh, for then Governor Mitt Romney of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they found gaps in her background, and so therefore they, um, they took her out of the closet as it actually was. Um, but still, uh, she, she accepted that, and, um, and so she was able to serve uh, in both roles uh, through her political career. Interestingly, she ran for office a total of 32 times. Uh, she was very determined to be able to provide service. Um, and she has run as a Republican, she has run as a Democrat, and she's also run as an independent. Uh, she proudly says that she voted for Donald Trump for, for president four years ago. Um, and she's also taken positions that um, uh, were, were not in support of same-sex marriage. Um, or of LGBTQ rights. However, she's been somebody out there that has uh, certainly been a pioneer in, in certain areas. So um, it gives you a taste of, of a group of women over 20 years that uh, some intentionally, um, and then also uh, some that were forced to become pioneers in the work and trying to um, trying to preserve the rights that we have today. And I think particularly as we think about the roles of women uh, in public office, um, I think all of us, whether you're gay, straight, male or female, or wherever you, you reside, um, we owe these women and we need to support candidates who are actually willing to fight for, for change or get candidates who have not wanted to um, have their own personal status uh, brought out as part of an election, but actually have had to deal with those issues. I think also um, it's important to, to note too that they have faced just untold amounts of discrimination. It was Elaine Noble who talked about the bullets going through her campaign windows and going through her, um, um, her apartment windows as well too. Or even going back to 2018 and seeing that these awful and very hateful things can be said uh, to these candidates, um, we have to we have to balance the hard work that they do and how they put themselves out there in order to be able to be there for us to actually put these things forward. And so we only have um, we have about 59 days. Um, uh, 59 days to the next election. Um, and so it's interesting to think that as this campaign and this election is really on all of our, our minds, it's important to think about what you want out of the candidates that you're going to be supporting and that you are going to be in front of you and your family and your loved ones and, and your friends. And I think in many ways you want to think about, you know, what are the risks that they're to taking? What are the things that, that they're asking of themselves and of each other and of all of us that we can actually improve the lives that, that, that we have and the chances and the opportunities that, that we have? Again, the most important thing, my only two cents of advice of all this is that um, be sure that you know how to vote. Be sure, well, number one, be sure that you're registered to, to vote. Be sure you know how you're going to vote, whether it's by mail or, or in person. Um, 
and uh, to, to be sure to call your candidates out um, and ask them some of the hard questions that are presented in front of you. I see we have a question here and um, uh, okay. And Katie Hill um, was a get candidate who was actually hounded out of office. And um, I appreciate that comment because these kind of things have happened to many women out there. So since we have a little bit of time left and we have some people here um, on Instagram and um, in uh, on Facebook, let's take, a, uh, if, Emery, if you don't mind, if we can walk backwards, let's take a little look and uh, just show people. For those of, it, of you who are in South Florida, again, we remind you to please come and uh, visit us here. We're open Monday through, uh, Monday through Friday from, let's uh, stop for one second. Monday through fr Friday uh, from 11 to, uh, to, to five. Um, and this entire exhibition will be up uh, on the website. And so now you're in the Ross Gallery here, and maybe you can just pull back a bit there, yes. Emory. And um, so this exhibition is one that we actually opened uh, two weeks ago. This is called First Look. And uh, this is, was my first opportunity to actually take a look at some of the treasures that are here in the archives at Stonewall. So just quickly going through here, here you see some of the publications that we have, uh, Chrysalis, Alive, TV Tapestry, um, Honcho, Income Inflation. Um, I love this, this is from, uh, it's a joint publication of the Policy Institute of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And, it, and it's a white paper on the topic of the myth of affluence among uh, gay, lesbian, and bisexual Americans. Uh, gay parenting, which of course, um, this is a more recent pu publication that we have. If you look down here, you can see a lot of what we have in the archives are custom-made scrapbooks. And so this, we, I don't know, we could probably have 100 or 200 of them, but this is just a sampling of the types of things that we have. In, uh, in the archives as far as scrapbook goes. And these are by uh, two different individuals and one group. I'm just going again through these quickly. All the way on the left here, these uh, three books there are done by somebody who we don't know who they were done by. Um, he's in the files as an anonymous. And it was somebody who, who simply was so obsessed with, with images, male images that he saw in many of the gay male skin magazines he created these books himself, and he, he would just uh, cut these individuals, uh, these individual pages out and put them in the books. And the center here, you see somebody else who was obsessed with movie stars of uh, mostly of the 1940s. And so in the center here is a book that he made on Sonia Henning. Henning. And um, in the back here is this Judy Garland book. And here is his Betty Grable book as well, too. And then all the way here on the right is a, uh, is a group called the, Flor uh, the um, Everglade Rawhides. And these are actually photo albums. And these are groups of gay men who would get together. They would have parties, sometimes clothes, sometimes not. That's why these cut covers are closed. And uh, they document the events that, that they had going back to 1988, you can see on, on this first one. So you've got 30 years of, of history of this group here. Um, behind me over here, um, there were many times that people, uh, gave that people didn't have ways of getting uh, in touch with each other. So here you see a collection of something known as Bob D Damien's uh, address book. Going back, we, the first one we have is 1970, which was a year after the Stonewall uh, uprising. And notice that, that many of these books, which are listing of, of places throughout the United States where gay people could meet and gather with each other, they didn't even use the word gay. So the book was promoted without uh, the, the word gay on the book cover. You would have to know that that was the topic of, of the contents of what was going on. Here we also have um, uh, Gia's Guide uh, from San Francisco, which was for women as well. Then over here, I just wanted to point out a few things um, in the archives and we'll walk through there shortly. Here you see some of the file headings that we have in the archives. This is just a, a small section 
there are probably 15 uh, files here and topics here, but this is, this is 15 out of 3,000 file headings that are in the, the archives. This just happens to be part of the Ds. Uh, it starts with Dignity Fort Lauderdale, Dignity Miami, which is a um, LGBTQ uh, re religious group, and then it goes on to dilettantes and dimensions and uh, directions and uh, directory of, of gay business services. And so you'll see when we walk in the archives that it, it's incredibly deep with what's going on. And then here you see something that many people saw, whether these were stacked up on top of a cigarette machine when such a thing existed, but these were publications that were printed. We have them from at least 75 cities throughout the United States that represent things that were going on and announcements that were going on within local areas. And again, this was a way that people were able to find community and to reach each other. And so here in this, you're seeing Cruise Magazine was a weekly publication in Detroit. Uh, Data Boy Nightlife was in California. Um, there was one which was very popular in New York. This is from 1979 called Where It's At. We have another publication, of course, with RuPaul on the, on the cover. She was uh, uh, very popular. We could do a show just about all the covers of RuPaul. Here's something called uh, uh, A Guide to the San Francisco Bay Area Underground Scene. And then um, here's a $2 book for great for all year. That's San Francisco, which is a guide to uh, San Francisco as well, too. So then Emory, if we can also just show right over here, this is just a representative sampling of some of the oral histories that we have here in the archives. Uh, we have over 100 oral histories, primarily of individuals from South Florida, but it's a way for us uh, to preserve uh, the history and what's going on. And so I think um, that's important. You'll be able to start seeing some of these things online as well. So let me, let me run a little bit ahead of you guys here. And to give you a sense of what's going on, so now behind me, you can see uh, this is the actual archive area. And um, there are 2,700 linear feet of materials, which really tell the story of LGBTQ people from the last quarter of the 20th century to the present day. And it's, so these are all climate controlled. Um, you can see many of the listings that we have, again, through our website. We're now working on a digitization project in which we're, um, we're actually attaching digital archives to the actual uh, serials and periodicals that we have here. Um, and so that will be coming out this fall as well. But just to give you a sense of some of the things that you can see here. So if you guys want to just pull these cameras around um, and just sort of take a, take a stroll down some of these aisles, we're here, all of these publications are arranged alphabetically. And these are the stories that can be told um, and, and from which the exhibition that you just saw, as well as all the exhibitions coming out um, from Stonewall will be based upon it. And so for us, it's really been an amazing pleasure to be able to go through um, the work that's here. And I wanna do a shout out to our chief archivist, Paul Pisana, uh, who has been lovingly um, working on these archives. And everything, of course, is, um, is cataloged at this point. Uh, and we want, by the way, let me, let me be really clear, anything that you have, any possible thing that you have that you think is important to us, please just put it in a box or drop it off and come bring it, or bring it here. Let us throw it away as opposed to you throwing it away. You can get a sense of some of the things that we have, as I said, um, from, the, uh, from our website, but it's better for us to see whether or not we have the only copy. 
you were looking earlier at copies of The Advocate and of Gay Community News and, and The Washington Blade. Some of these things, they, they were never, they, they were printed 50 years ago. They were never meant to last this long. And it's important and they need to be digitized, but it's important for us to be able to keep copies in this kind of environment that, that these actual documents. So whether it's publications that you have, whether it's correspondence that you have, please, please, please save that stuff and bring it to us, as well as books that go into the library as well. And the last thing I'll do is just give you a sense of what we call the lateral files here. And uh, I am, and um, here you can see these again are all the to topics that we have, and they're, and they're just listed. There are 3,000 subject head headings here. And um, these are just things that come in over the transom. Um, this drawer is, um, you know, just to give you a sense of the range, it goes, you know, from a chorus line uh, with an original pr program here um, to a publication called Chris um, to um, something called Christ's Way. Sorry? See what changing tides are. Okay, changing tides. But here's Christ's Way, which are newsletters from the Christ Metropolitan Community Church in Florida, going back to 1978. Again, the ability to, to serve um, the community and save these, to be able to save this part of our, of our history so that you're seeing a religious publication next to a gay male publication to a Broadway show, you're seeing all the, the, the depth of what actually exists within, uh, within the collection. Um, which was the one you were saying? Yeah, no, sure. I think Changing I Tides? Yeah, it's right. Okay, I'm sorry. Who knows? I don't know yet. Eh. Well, you know, that's the thing that we enjoy here so much is that being able to do it. So this is Changing Tides. And again, this is another religious one, the Church of Our Savior, MCC from Boca Raton. Uh, this is 1996 here on the cover. And this goes back to uh, 1997 in this particular case. Let me make sure we get that back. So um, that gives you a little bit of insight into what as to what's going on here. A uh, couple things just before I close, and uh, Emery's going to check to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, remember to, to uh, sign up for our newsletter. You can do that through our website. Uh, Emery's probably going to throw a link out to you right now. Be sure that you're get, getting that. We do virtual talks um, every week, either on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday night. We do exhibitions. Uh, these exhibitions are up about uh, about two, two months each now, and we're actually scheduled now for the next 18 months, which is great. And all these exhibitions are coming from our archives. And um, be sure to let anybody you know, um, young or old, who believe or who you believe would be interested in the role that women have played, particularly um, LGBTQ women, in the election process. It's a very important thing for them to be able to understand some of this history and to learn from this. Um, so I think that's all I have. And uh, Emery's got one more quick question here that he wants to ask. Emery, no, he's good. All right, everybody, it's great to see you all. Um, and uh, yes, look under public programming. And uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, hope everybody has a safe uh, Labor Day weekend. Um, don't go in too big crowds. Let's stay away. I have my mask here too. I'm not wearing it just because of what we're doing here. But um, be healthy and be happy. See you next time. Thank you.